Ephesians 2 verse 3. Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, our behavior governed by the sinful self, indulging the desires of human nature without the Holy Spirit and the impulses of the sinful mind. We were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being ever so rich, very rich, in mercy but God being rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love which he has for us even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins he made us spiritually alive with Christ for his grace his undeserved undeserved favor and mercy you have been saved from God's judgment because of his great love because of his wonderful love turn to anybody and say God's love for me is great most of you did not do that you're disobeying in church your candidacy for heaven is under question so turn to your neighbor the other one that you ignored and now look them in the eye and then say to them, God's love for me is great. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. It comes to purify, it comes to sanctify, it comes to transform. I remove any demonic impediments, any demonic obstruction to hearing your word. Every distraction, every detractor, every worry that is replaying in our minds. Satan, I rebuke you. You have no place in the minds and the hearts and the ears of the people we shall see because the lamp and the light of the word shall shine on our path in jesus name amen thank you so much emil um how many of you have a baby in your life like a an infant a toddler uh, how many of you have that how many of you have, have done that thing with them where you ask them how much do you think uncle loves you and they're like this big or that big i'm I, I mean, if you did that i did that i wanted to be assured of their love and i wanted them to be assured of mine one of the, the best things to do or to see is to see the eye of that child light up when they're like trying to stretch their hands. How, how big? They're like this big and how big this big? They're trying to do everything. And it's wonderful to see that. And when most of us gave our lives to Jesus, if we have, or when most of us, at some point in your life, you might remember when you felt that the love of God was that big, that wide. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. At some point, if you've ever surrendered your life to Jesus, you felt that overflowing love of God. And if God had asked today, how much do you think I love you? You would have stretched your hands. But over the course of time, um, our conviction about the love of God begins to wane. Life happens and things happen and our conviction begins to wane and it's like, I'm not really sure if God loves me. And Valentine's Day is tomorrow, love is in the air, people are making plans, everyone is aware of love. But the question is, how many of us are actually aware? When was the last time you were aware of the love of God? Like you actually like kept quiet and just felt loved by God. That warm, cuddly reassurance that someone in heaven loves you what was the last time you were you had a keen keen perception keen feeling about the love of Jesus in case for those of you who are wondering if God loves you let me read some verses for you to reassure you Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 says this the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Psalm 63 verse 3 says, Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Isaiah 54 verse 10, For the mountains may move and the hills may disappear, but even then my faithful love, this is God talking, will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken says the Lord. Ephesians 3 verse 18 says, and I pray, Paul is praying that you may have the power to understand with us all of God's people how wide, how long, how high, how deep is his love for you. May you experience the love of God, though it is great to fully understand. 
Ephesians 2 verse 4 says that God being rich in mercy because of his great love. The love of God is steadfast. The love of God is unfailing. The love of God is faithful. The love of God is great. That's how much love God has for you. So why aren't we keen on the love of God? Why aren't we aware of for the love of God? Paul understands this and writes to this church in Ephesians um, chapter 3 verse 18. And he says, may you have the power to understand. Most of you don't, un I wish you could understand. Paul is saying, what does that word understand mean? That word is the Greek word, katalambano. Katalambano means, I'm going to speak a lot of Greek today. I'm not trying to show off, just trying to show you something. Please, just permit me, I'm a bilingual preacher. What? Um, <laughs> oh God, okay, we're back. Um, katalambano means to lay hold of with your mind. Imagine your mind has hands and you grab something. That's Catalan, but it means to lay hold as to make something your own. To understand, to, to perceive, to obtain, to attain to, to make something your own, to take possession of something. So when Paul is saying, I pray that you might understand he is saying i pray that you might comprehend i pray that you might lay hold as to make it your own and we talked about when god began to love you god began to love you Ephesians chapter one even before the world was formed and paul is saying that love was there before you were born the question is can you comprehend it yeah. can you understand it the word K-A-T-A, kata means down from above, from an area of concentration, high concentration, to an area of less concentration. Lambano means to receive, to lay hold of, to take something with your hand. What kata lambano means, that understanding Paul is talking about, is to taste, like going to the pantry to eat, to, you want to eat some rice, and you go to the pantry to get some rice. So there's a lot of rice in the pantry. You can only eat rice if you take your plate or your pot and you go to the pantry from an area of high concentration of rice. You scoop some rice and put it on your plate. Then you can eat. Paul is saying that there is an area of concentration of the love of God. It was there before you were born. The question is, can you comprehend it? Can you take your life and go to the pantry of God's love and scoop you some love ever so often and remind yourself about the love of Jesus? He said, I pray that you might comprehend. I pray, verse 19, that you might experience. Experience is the Greek word gnosko. Gnosko means to learn by experience. There's another word, eido, for know. That means to just know mentally. But gnosko means I'm learning by experiencing it. I'm doing it. I'm enjoying it. And my, my knowledge of it is based on my actual experience of it. So Paul is saying, first of all, I pray you have the power to understand, to comprehend what is the love of God, how deep, how wide it is for you. And I also pray that your knowledge is not just mental knowledge, that is actually experiential knowledge. Yeah. It's not enough to just listen to what I'm saying. It's not enough to just hear the words that I'm saying. Paul is saying, I need you to experience it for yourself. Understand it with your mind and then leave it out in your life. Most of us have heard about the love of God, love of God, love of God. Pastor, I know what you're saying. My question is, do you gnosko it? Do you know it by experience? Not by what the pastor said. Not by what you read in the Bible. That's catalambano. You've accepted it as truth. But have you applied it to your life? I was talking last week and I said, I can give you a $200 gift card. It's yours. Catalambano. You have laid, laid hold of it. You've taken it. It's in your wallet. It belongs to you. The question is, are you going to spend it? Are you going to experience the benefits of having a $200 gift card? That's Gnosko. So you can come to me after you spend the money and say, Pastor Vic, I just bought some shoes and I used that gift card. What is the product of God's love in your life? Come on, come on. 
When were you down and you just remembered God's love and he quickened you on the inside? When were you discouraged and you can say, a little, two weeks ago I was down, but then I remembered that the God of the universe actually loves me. I received a bad report and I realized, you know what? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the one that loves him, is at peace. That's you knowing by experience. What is the love of God? So the question you're asking me, Pastor Victor, is how, 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 do I, how do I get that though? For two weeks now, you've been talking about it. I have, I have, I have a, a process for you. How many of you remember the time when you accepted your name as your name? Can you remember when you said, you know what? I accept my name is Rosette. That's my name. If I recall, you were born, and then these two adults began to say a word. And then when they are referring to you, they are saying this word. And then you realize everybody has a word associated with them. And then you realize it's okay to have a word associated with you. And then you begin to answer that word when your parents say it. And this process of speaking and hearing continues till one day someone asks you your name uh-huh. and you repeat that word. Yeah. And you can't remember when you accepted yeah. right. that that was right. your name. Right. 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 If you engage your mouth, <laughs> if you engage your mouth, the Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 20, from the fruit of your mouth, a person's stomach is filled. If, if you followed me for a while, you hear me say, you cannot cast down a thought with a thought. You cast down an imagination with words. The Bible says, from the fruit of your lips, your belly is full. From the harvest of your lips, you are satisfied. What does that mean? Your conviction is fueled by your words. If you start saying, God loves me. If you woke up in the morning and you said, I am loved by God. God created me to love me. Most of what God does is love me. God's love for me is steadfast. It's unfailing. It's great. God's love for me, it has preceded my birth. God will still love me when I'm gone. I don't have to earn it. I just I don't have to work for it. All I have to do is receive it. God's love for me overrides the trauma, overrides the pain of my past. God's love for me overrides comes the abuse past and present God's love for me erases any name that anyone has called me it reverses any label that anyone has given to me it reaffirms my identity and my purpose it protects me from the causes of the enemy today I walk confident in the love of God nothing can separate me from the love of if you woke up every day and you said to yourself I am loved by God it will satisfy you. At some point, you just realize that you know without a shudder of a doubt that God loves you. And that all began by you saying it. So today, it's about you hearing it and practicing saying it. Tomorrow, it's about you saying it. You wake up in the morning, you feel some kind of, I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. God's love for me is great. God's love for me is great. Now, the question, when you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says that God being rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love. You can read that word great and just pass by it and just see like the child will say great, big. I'm like, oh, God's love for me is big, yay. And then you move on. God did not let me leave that word alone last week. The word great is the Greek word polus, P-O-L-Y, where we get the word poly from. Polus, P-O-L-O-S, it's pronounced polus in the Greek, but it's actually polis in the English, poly. It means something that is many or much in any respect. So when the Bible says God's love for me is great, he's saying God's love for me is many or much in any respect. And God began to take me deeper in it. Number one, the Bible says that when, God, when we say God's love is great, it means that God's love is many, is numerous, it's a multitude. Now, my parents are here, so I have to put them into the preaching. 
so I impressed them. Um, <laughs> this week, I made oatmeal for my parents. The first night, I made oatmeal for them. They were like, oh, this is small, this is small. The next night, I miscalculated. You know that oatmeal has a pre-cooked state and a post-cooked state. <laughs> I, I put a post-cooked quantity for the pre-cook. <laughs> so when that thing finished cooking, a multitude of oatmeal lost their lives <laughs> trying to feed my parents. When they saw it, they gasped, like, what is this? That's a multitude. That's many. That's the same word where the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful. Mark, Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, 37, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. The multitude, the harvest is, is like a multitude. It's many. It's numerous. There's a story in Luke chapter 7 of a woman who came to Jesus. The Bible says she stood behind Jesus and was crying. Jesus was at the house of this um, religious leader. She was crying and she cried and she wet the feet of Jesus, dried the, his feet with, his, with her hair, and she anointed his leg with oil. And the Pharisees were like, if you knew this woman and knew how bad this woman is, you would not let her touch you. And Jesus turned around and gave them a parable. He said, a, a, a boss forgave two servants of their debt. One of the debts was smaller than the other. So which of the servants do you think would be more appreciative? He said, probably, the, the religious leader said, probably the guy who was forgiven more. And he turned to the woman and said to the woman that seeing this woman, her sins were poorly, her sins were many, and forgiveness was many also. What does that mean? God, God, God is saying to you that this woman had many sins and she experienced many love. She had numerous sins and she experienced numerous love. She has a, had an abundance of sin and she experienced an abundance of love. She had plenty of sin. God is saying you might feel that your sin is many. You might feel that you've done so many bad things. That God cannot possibly forgive all of them. I'm asking you to change your image. When I say God loves you, sometimes we see one being, God loving me, being one person. One is to one. What if you change your perspective of love and you saw the love as a multitude, like a crowd of people that are running towards you? When you say God loves you, I need to see a crowd of God's love, like all of heaven is running towards you to embrace you for every reason you have discounted yourself for every reason that you feel shame, for every reason that you feel depressed, for every reason that you feel that you are disqualified, God is saying, I have enough love to knock them out, to knock them out one by one. God's love is both a bomb and a quiver full of arrows. It's a bomb, it can take it out at a macro level. Blow it all up. Blow up the shame. Blow up the depression, blow up the addiction, and it's also as precise as an arrow to go into the, the things you cannot say, that if you knew you would not sit near me, if you knew what I did last night, that single thing that the devil replaced, that three seconds of mistake that he plays for over 30 minutes in your mind, he's saying, I have a precise love that is numerous enough to take out everything you think is a disqualification. It's numerous. God's love covers the sins of many people and covers the many sins of a person. God's love is macro enough to cover the sins of many people and micro enough to cover the singular many sins of a person. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 says, So as Christ died only once as an offering for the sins of many people. The challenge therefore is this. The people that have so many sins and have the potential for so much love are the ones who actually experience the most shame. People who have a checkered history are also the ones who cannot bring themselves to be loved by God. Because they stand at the crossroads. Am I going to accept a lot of love? Or am I going to accept a lot of shame? 
Because there's every reason for me to be ashamed because I'm not like every other person. You don't understand. The state has already re registered my name. I'm an offender recognized by the state. God could, if the state can recognize me and label me an offender, God cannot forgive me. You don't understand how bad I have been. God is saying, if the worse you are, the greater my love. Actually, you should be the one. It's almost saying, the hungrier you are, the more you can eat. Most of us have had a good past. And you're not really hungry. When they ask, are you hungry? Just a little snack. You can snack on the love of God. No, you're good. You were never bad. You never really sinned. When they say, they'll give your life to Christ, you're like, I'm already good. Like, no, let's just do it. For some of us, our sin is a lot. Our spirit is hungry. God is saying, as hungry as you are for the love of God, feed on it. Satisfy your spiritual hunger with the love of God, with a feast on the greatness of the love of God. Whether you're bold enough to come to the face of God or whether you're like this woman that stood behind, everything she did, let me understand, let me make you understand. This woman that broke the alabaster box, broke it from behind. She was so ashamed, she never came to the front of Jesus. I said, standing behind Jesus, she began to cry. She began to wet everything she did. And we talk about the alabaster box. And when we have pictures, we see the woman in front of Jesus. No, the woman was actually behind Jesus. Jesus did not need her, remember? to change her routine. Jesus, I'm going to meet you where you are. Maybe you're still in shame. He said, don't worry, my love is going to overtake your shame. That's the greatness of the love of God. That's the greatness of the love of God. It's enough to knock out the stain in your life. Have you ever washed a, a load of laundry with not enough detergent? And then you open it and then it's washed. But it's not, like, it's not smelling washed. <laughs> no, it's like a mixture of detergent and sweat. It's not, it, you can see it's wet, but then if you think about washing your load with a lot of detergent, when you open it, the fragrance of detergent hits you. That's the love of God. He said, my love will saturate. That when you finally, people come in contact, all they will smell is the sweet fragrance of the love of Jesus in your life. The love of God is numerous, it's a multitude, it's many. Number two, the love of God, that word great there means intense. When it comes before a noun, it means intense. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18, that there was a voice in Ramah. This was when Herod um, decided to kill all the kids two years and, and below. He said there was great mourning. That word there, great, is intense mourning. Paul said to Philemon, Philemon chapter 7, verse 7, he says, we have great joy, we have intense joy. What are the implications of the intense joy of God? It means that no matter how intense, most of you is just a multitude, you've done it many times, you've tried to shake it, most of you is just deep addiction, you've done everything you can, you've gone to counseling, you've tried to talk to that, a pastor has talked to you and you just feel you are in too deep, you are too stained, it cannot shake off, it's not going to break off, God is saying, my love for you is as intense as that sin. My love for you is as intense as that addiction. My love for you is as intense as that shame. My love for you is as intense as that depression. So I have seasonal depression and every time between the months of October and March, I just feel down. God is saying, no matter how intense and how long that has lasted, how intense it is, my love is even more intense. If one of the times when I was growing up, I remember when I, I was trying to get my whites to be really white. And I put a bunch load of bleach and then I soaked the white for like two hours. And then I came and it had torn the shirt. I lifted up the shirt and there were holes because of the intensity of the bleach that taking out the fabric of my cloth. God is saying, take your life, soak it in my intense love and it will take out what, whoo, it will take out whatever you thought was a, the Bible says this, the Bible says that you should come, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, come let us talk over this, says the Lord, no matter how deep the stain of your sin is, I will take it out, 
I will take out the stain and make the cloth as fresh as freshly fallen snow. Even if they are as red as crimson, I will make them as white as snow. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 20, for the law came to increase and expand the awareness of trespass by defining and unmasking sin. But when sin increased, God's remarkable gracious gift of grace, his unmerited favor surpassed it and increased all the more. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, all that passing laws did in the message, it says this, that when sin came, it just produced lawbreakers. But what sin didn't do and doesn't do, sin doesn't have a competition, a chance when it is in competition with the aggressives. Most of us, when we talk about the love of God, it's like, oh, love of Jesus, it's so cuddly, it's so warm, I like the love of Jesus. No! What the love of Jesus is, it's aggressive. No matter how deep the sin has been, it's aggressive enough to knock it out. The question is, will you let your life be soaked in it? Will you have a gnosko, an experience of it, of the intensity of God's love, the aggressiveness of God's love? That, that scripture says that where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. He said, no matter how deep the stain was, the bleach in the water was strong enough to knock out the stain and take out the cloth if it needs to. That's the concentration. The Bible says, when sins abound, that word there is pleonazo. Pleonazo means to superabound, to exist in abundance, to make, to increase. He said, when sin was superabounding, when sin was on the increase, grace abounded more. That word there is hyperperiseo. Hyperperiseo means this, to abound beyond any form of measure. It means to abound exceedingly, to overflow. Let's make it better. Hyper there, you know what hyper means? Hyper means to be over, to be beyond. Periseo means to exceed a limit. So God is saying when sin was super abounding, my love came and periseo, it exceeded the sin. As if that was not enough. I added a hyper to the periseo to really overshadow your shame, to really overshadow your sin. That's the intensity. When I say God loves you, it's not a godly love. It's aggressive enough to come for you wherever you are. It's aggressive enough to die for you if it has to. It's aggressive enough to knock out whatever the devil has been lying to in your ears. That's the aggression, the intensity of the love of God. If you want to clap, put your hands together and celebrate the love of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's sin many died, much more the grace of God and the gifts of grace to, of one man, Jesus, abounded perisil to many poly. So not only is the love of God intense, that intense love of God does not lose its power because the sins of many people. It doesn't lose the many multitude dimension because it is intense. He said, I can be intense and aggressive as I am to one as to all of you. The love of God is a multitude. That picture has not left, it's in my mind forever. When you say God loves you, think of a crowd like a stampede coming your way. Multitude. The love of God is intense. And number three, the love of God is long lasting. It's long lasting. That word there, the great also means long. The Bible says in John chapter five, verse six, that there was a man who had been lying there for a pulley, long time. Pulley, he had been there for many days, for a long period of time. The Bible says, that God loved us a long time ago. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, before the world was made. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, long ago, God said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. 
What does everlasting mean? It means that it's been there before you were born and it's going to be there after you've left. It's long, it has a long duration, antiquity, it's perpetual. It has continuous existence. How is the love of God everlasting? We've established that God said that my love is, is, is everlasting. The Bible says that Abraham in Genesis 21 offered a sacrifice to the everlasting God. The Bible says in John chapter 4 verse 16 that God is love. That means if God is everlasting and God is love, when he loves me, he invokes the everlasting part of him in his love for me. You can never run out of the love of God. You can never get to the point where you go, okay, now nah, God has stopped loving me. No, he said he will always love you. He was loving you before you were born. He's going to love you after you were gone. God's love is forever. Ecclesiastes 3, 14. And I perceived that whatever what God does is forever. Last week we said Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, that mostly what God does is love you. So that means the Bible is saying that what God does endures forever. Mostly what God does is love me. That means when God loves me, it endures forever. Do the math. When an everlasting God loves you, he loves you with everlasting love. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's long lasting. I, I pray you're embracing what I'm saying. It will change the way you walk. It will change the way you pray. You stop begging God. When, when you know somebody loves you, like <laughs> you take advantage of it. <laughs> Most of us don't take advantage of God. Wow. They announce in the office, we are laying off 25% of the staff. <gasps> You're already crying. No. You, the person that owns the cattle upon the thousand hills, and the Bible says, whatever is in the earth, the fullness thereof belongs to him, yeah. is in love with you. Yeah. Take advantage of it. Yeah. You'll be like, oh yeah, you guys can get fired. <laughs> um, the guy that loves me owns the company, owns the person that owns the company, <laughs> so I'm good. Yeah. Most of us don't pray like the person we are praying to loves us. Yeah. There's a difference when you go to somebody you don't know that loves you, asking for something. And when you know somebody is madly yeah. in love. Let me tell you how much God loves you. You're sleeping. And he's looking at you like, look at the way she snores. Look at that. <laughs> look at that. 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 Look at he watches over you. He's like a stalker. <laughs> like wherever you are, he's there. You go to bed, you wake up, he's there. Just looking at you like. <laughs> and most of us don't take advantage of that. He's long lasting. It will outlive whatever you think is disqualifying you. It will outlive your pretense, you're pretending that everything is okay. It will outlive it until you actually accept his love. It will outlive the addiction, it will outlive the doctor's report, it will outlive seasonal depression, pain, your past and then what's of, it does not change not because there's no diminishing returns with God's love. As strong as it was, if it was strong enough to forgive Adam thousands of years ago, Think of how strong it is now for the sin you sinned 25 years ago. Think of how strong it is. It doesn't lose. It, doesn't, it will never lose its power. And we just sing it. Listen to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. There's no expiry date. Yeah. It doesn't degrade over time. Like, man, no, my, if this was 40 years ago, man, like I can understand. But man, with all the sins God has been wiping, wow. By, by now, God will be tired. God's like, no, I'm here. Exactly with the same amount of, of, of love. Do you want some love? I'll give you more than enough love. I have too much love. You want only two? I can give you three, four, five. You want, I can give you for your future. You know what? There's a storage of love. You can have it whenever you want it. Yeah. The question is, do you want the love of God? There's a story in Hosea chapter 1. The band can come back. In the Old Testament, 
the prophets usually would, or God would make the prophets leave out the prophecy that they had. So you see the prophets leave it out. If let's say the, the, the Bengals are going to win today, you see like Isaiah wear a Bengals jersey and be celebrating <laughs> on, <laughs> on the street. <laughs> oh God. But he made them, and that was not a, a funny thing then. They had to leave it out. So their life was also the prophecy. They said it, and then they leave it out. Hosea chapter 1, we see the story of Hosea. The Bible says that the Lord's message came to Hosea, son of Beeri. Verse 2 says this, the first time God spoke to Hosea, he said, find a whore and marry her. <laughs> Most of us will not be like, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I come again. Pastor, I was in the house, and then I heard a voice say, go and marry a whore. That is the devil. Who agree with me? No weapon from, I've been waiting to be married. Why would you do that? That is of the devil. I don't know why that voice would come. I need to go on fasting and prayer. God was like, yeah, go and marry a prostitute. And not only should you marry the prostitute, have kids with the prostitute. Like entrench yourself. When I said that most of you are thinking away from yourself, you are the prostitute in that story. Hosea is God. We are the ones that don't deserve any love. I told you the difference between agape and every other kind of love is that there is no premise. There is nothing in me that should evoke God loving me. But he went and picked me up. The Bible says, even our righteousness as filthy rags before him. Like it's nasty. You trying to be good is irritating to God. The Bible says, go and, go and marry a whore, go and marry a prostitute. Have children with that prostitute. And over time, the prostitute gave birth to two boys and a girl. And the prostitute did not shake off her nature. She actually went back. She went back to doing what she was doing before she experienced the love of Hosea, her husband. And the Bible says, in chapter 3, verse 1, then God ordered me, start all over again. Love your wife again. Your wife who is in bed with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife, love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people. Even as they flirt, flirt and party with every other God. Told this guy, not only are you supposed to marry a prostitute, not only are you supposed to seal that marriage and produce kids, she's going to go back to the mess again where you found her. You did not say go and marry a repentant prostitute that was a prostitute. Go and marry somebody who is actually in the act. She's, do, she's there right now. She has not changed. And when you have kids, she's going to go back again and do what she was doing when you found her. And when you find her, start all over again. The Bible actually goes on to say that, that I will pay. He said, Hosea said, I did it. And I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homa of barley. That price there, the Bible says, and when you do the research, the price of 15 shekels, that's cumulative, and one and a half um, ho um, homas of barley is 30 pieces of silver, 30 shekels of silver. Where else do you hear that? That was what Jesus was worth. That was the price of a slave. He said, go and get that woman back. Pastor Victor, why are you saying this? I'm saying that the solution to repeated rejection is everlasting love. I'm saying that tomorrow you're going to go and do it again. And guess what God is going to do? He's going to come and start loving you again. I'm saying that tomorrow you're going to make that mistake again. Guess what God is going to do? 
As you are making the mistake, he's going to hit the reset button. I love you again. Start from zero one more time. I'm going to love you as if I did not love you yesterday. I'm going to treat you as if you've reduced yourself to the position of a slave. But I'm going to love you like my wife. You're going to go back and you might fall again for that lie of the enemy. And guess what God is going to do? Start again. Love you again. Start again. Love you again. That's the everlasting love of God. When you think you're far from it, it's right there. Say, I'm here. I will start again. I will love you again like you did not sin. For those of you who are saying, I've made the mistake so many times. Pastor Victor, you don't understand. I've tried my best. As hard as you have tried to do it by yourself, it's as hard as God is trying to get you to understand how much he loves you. And when you fall, guess what he's going to do? He's going to start again. When you make that mistake on Wednesday and you watch what you're not supposed to watch, right there and then, he's going to start loving you again. When you fall for the lie of the enemy, thank you, Jesus, and you have that suicidal thought, and you're like, ah, oh. guess what he's going to do? He's going to say, I love you. I still love you. Like as if you did not do anything. And all he's asking you to do is Ephesians. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says this, that I pray that you embrace what God does for you because that's the best thing that you can do. You're looking for how to please God. You're looking for how to make God happy. It's not by doing anything. He said, how you make me happy is by accepting what I've done for you. And that's all I'm asking you to do. If you can be upstanding on your feet, everyone.